very, very, very good evening to all of you present here. My name is Vinay Kaushal, and I'm a guitar player. Now, I'm usually on stage about two nights a week, sometimes more, sometimes less. So I'm no stranger to being in the limelight. Talking to an audience this size, however, is a tad bit new to me, so I won't pretend that I'm not a little nervous. But I have brought my best friend along to keep you guys entertained in case I falter along the way. Now let me tell you something about guitar players, and I know that each and every one of you present here has that one over-enthusiastic guitarist friend. This one guy who's just at it. He's, he's, just, he's just always on his instrument, noodling. That's the term. He's constantly noodling on the instrument. A series of unrelated notes just flying by at full speed. It almost sounds like there's a mosquito near your ear that you just can't get your hands on. You know what I mean? Something like this, maybe. <laughs> The truth is, we guitarists, we are, in a, we are constantly in this state of intense musical exploration, trying to achieve these unimaginable heights of awesomeness, right? To become guitar gods, basically. In, in fact, the, the term noodling is so popular that it's almost embarrassing that our, that our wizardry on the instrument has any slightest connection with a packet of Maggie or Top Ramen. Speaking of noodling, my, my wife came up with a really good one the other day. What does it take to get a guitar player to stop his noodling? <laughs> Being invited to a TEDx talk, of course. <laughs> yeah. But OK, so when I was invited to talk here today, I was, I was thrilled, ecstatic about the idea until I read the theme for the event, something to do with the word parallax. Now let me come clean right here and now. I'm no scientist. I had to Google the word right away. Uh, not only did I learn a new word that sounds incredibly cool, by the way, Parallax. I'm pretty sure my next album is going to be titled Parallax. Please look out for that one. Uh, <laughs> but it also got me thinking about various lessons I've learned in life uh, through music that can be applied to life as a whole. And I'd like to share these stories with you today, starting with lesson number one. Your mother's always right. I grew up right here in Pune with a mother who plays the sitar and plays it really well. My earliest musical memories are the sounds of this incredible, incredible instrument. Jumping to my teens and the world of rock and roll opened up and I picked up the guitar. And I got decently good at it rather quickly. I was that popular boy in school who could strum the chords of summer of 69. People egged me on and I kept playing, exploring Pink Floyd to Pearl Jam. And somewhere along the way, my mother said, hey, you know what, Vinay, it might not hurt for you to learn some Indian classical music too. As you might have guessed, no. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't pay much heed to her. Rock and roll and all of that, you know? That whole teenage thing that you feel, right? Uh, but luckily for me, it turns out that being in a certain environment conditions you without you even knowing it. I had all these impressions of Indian music being made on me all through my childhood. Now, in 2012, I, I went off to the United States of America to study music. Musicians Institute in Los Angeles. Bang, in the middle of Hollywood. Oh, what a place to be. Now here I was, surrounded by all these incredible guitar players, these guys who've had a couple of guitars lying around their houses as they grew up, probably learning to noodle on them before they could even talk. Uh, you know, guys who, who, who grew up listening to the blues and playing the blues, maybe something like this. who picked up the guitar in his teens. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So yeah, it was a little intimidating, but it turns out that listening to all that classical music had somehow seeped into my playing just a little bit. All my classmates, they loved my sound. They thought I sounded incredibly cool. I sounded Eastern, which for them was very, very hard to replicate. Uh, I had my own unique sound. One of my professors joked about it by saying that my guitar spoke with a stronger Indian accent than even I did. <laughs> And then, you know, things just kind of fell into place. I was more comfortable in my shoes. And that year turned out to be one of the most, one of the best years of my life, full of learning, performing, and soul searching. It makes me think back to if I had just paid a little more heed to what my dear mother said, I wonder how much better I'd be. So the moral of the story, oh yes, you already know it. Moving on to when I was, you know, just back from music school, I was staying in Mumbai trying to do any and every gig that came my way. You know what the rents in Mumbai are like, right? And generally, I was trying to figure my way out as a professional musician. By now, I was a big fan of the blues, and I'd also studied the genre, right? I got called for a very, very, very peculiar gig. There was a famous American blues singer coming down to perform in an auditorium, backed by some of the finest musicians from Bombay. I was going to play, too. Just not in the auditorium, but in the foyer outside, before the main performance and during the intermission. Now here I was, straight out of music school, dressed super sharp, and playing my heart out, man, in a corner though, right? While the who's who of the city were on the other side chatting over a cup of coffee. Nobody really cared about what I was doing, or at least that's how I saw it. I felt pretty terrible, but the show must go on. About half an hour later, the doors to the auditorium were opened and people rushed in to grab their seats for the performance they had paid to watch. I had a full hour to kill before the intermission, which was my second set. And I kept thinking and overthinking the whole thing. And by the time you know, it was time for my second set, I was positively depressed. I was wondering what another 20 minutes of the same humiliation would do to me. Turns out, I had never been so wrong. I had about 50 people come up and talk to me, tell me how much they enjoyed my playing. Many people took photos and videos. I handed out about 30 business cards, so that's a successful gig right there. A charming old lady went to the extent of even saying that, hey, you should have been there on that stage instead of those guys. A big takeaway uh, for me from this experience was that people enjoyed my playing a lot more than I thought they did, which is true in life, right? People enjoy and appreciate you a lot more than you think they do. Speaking of appreciation, I have many, many friends who, who are constantly complaining to me about their nine to five. They say, hey, Vinay, you're so lucky to do whatever you want, whenever you want, since you don't have a day job how weekends is the only time they get to you know, hang out with their friends and let loose a little bit. Now the funny thing is that while I really, really love my job on a day-to-day -day basis, hey, I miss my weekends too. I'm working round the clock despite what day of the week it is. I rarely get two days off in a row. Forget about Saturdays and Sundays because I'm usually playing the guitar on stage on those days. And these kind of conversations always ended in a deadlock until a rather wise friend of mine pointed this out to me. And you might want to brace yourself for this one. I get to work because of the people who have the weekends and the guys who have the weekends can enjoy it because of my work. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Okay, lesson four, and I'm going to read this one out to you. The ups in life are ups because there are the downs. Intense, no? <laughs> thank you, thank you. In music, this, context, uh, this concept exists in terms of consonance and dissonance. Consonance being the harmony between two notes that makes you feel good, you know, comfortable, elated, and dissonance is kind of the opposite, the lack of the same harmony that makes you feel a little stressed out, a little not at ease. 
right? And I'd like to show you exactly this. What is brilliant, though, is that without one, there would never have been another. I'd like you all to close your eyes just for a minute so you can focus on the sound. Let's start with consonants, you know, the feel-good stuff. Please close your eyes. Feels good, right? Happy, light. Dissonance is kind of just the opposite. Dissonance. So now what's amazing is that without, without consonants, there would have been no dissonance, and likewise. What we, I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. What we composers do is we use both these concepts together to you know, change the mood up, highlight the other one more, like to highlight consonants, you play a lot of dissonance and then go to consonants and stuff like that. And generally, to keep you guys interested in the whole, whole piece of music. I'm gonna exaggerate this just a little bit uh, to show you the stark difference between the two. I request you all to close your eyes again. See what I mean? Two sides of the same thing that won't exist without one another. It's, it's very, very similar in life. You can't have known any happiness if you haven't known some degree of sadness at, at some point of time in your life, right? To quote the great Carl Jung, the word happiness would lose its meaning if it didn't, if it wasn't balanced out with sadness, unquote. Now, if you wrap your head around those things and embrace it, you can, you know, achieve something great. And speaking of greatness, in our quest to become guitar gods, <laughs> what we end up doing is we play very, very fast, you know, guitar players. You know them. Everybody here knows them. Constantly playing. And the thing is, it is so important to pause, to slow down. Now, music is made up of three main ingredients, rhythm, melody, and silence. You probably like your favorite song because it has all these three ingredients in the perfect balance. Rhythm and melody are simple enough to understand, but silence, let's talk about that for a second. What is silence? Silence in this context is maybe the pause in a song, like between two verses, or it could also mean the little, little pauses that exist in a melody something we call phrasing. I'm gonna play you a string of notes without the pauses. See if you can recognize what this is, and if you can, how you feel about it, okay? pauses right back in. Check it out. Pink 
Panther, right? The Pink Panther thing. Thank you. But you saw what, how big a difference that made, right? Just the pauses coming in, this melody suddenly breathing and dancing around because, because the great composer, Henry Mancini, put those pauses in just the right places. Great phrasing for us, for us musicians. I feel like it's very, very similar in life. It doesn't hurt to take a moment to collect your thoughts in a, in a, in a conversation or generally to take a step back and ponder things over. To cut a long story short, take that holiday that you want to take, basically. <laughs> to sum it up, just like you need both your eyes to perceive something on the horizon, you need a good set of notes, a few experiences, and a whole lot of feelings to make a song. Unraveling the parallax is the theme for today, and I hope that music will always help us set aside our biases and see the bigger picture. I'd like to end this wonderful, wonderful experience at TEDx VIT Pune by playing you a piece of music that I wrote, which I think draws from all these experiences. The ups and downs, the consonants and dissonance, the pauses. Please welcome my good, good friend and ace percussionist Shreya Sayangar on stage for this one. We present to you Naked on a Train. Thank you very much.